Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School today. We consider the Sabbath School lessons to be the most important part of our Sabbath day and studying them and we encourage you to study these lessons on stewardship. Our particular purpose here is to see them from the vantage point of the 1888 message and the great themes that God has brought to our attention there. So we invite you to pray as we begin our study. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us life, breath, and health, and strength that we can expand our minds by searching in the word the truths that you've given to us. We ask this in the Savior's name. Amen. This is lesson number three, entitled God or Mammon. One day there was a young man who came running up to Jesus almost out of breath. He said, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's a wonderful new convert to be asking this question of the Savior. And Jesus caught his word, do. And he proceeded to give him a thoroughly legalistic answer. Jesus said, keep the commandments. And he cited the Ten Commandments. Well, on the surface, Jesus' answer must have thrilled this legalist as well as legalists today. Well, we can understand that the young man who came to Jesus was really fishing for more from him. And so he told Jesus that he had done everything specified in the commandments since he was a child. He asked, what do I still lack? And what he meant was he wanted to achieve perfection, which is the goal of every legalist. Then Jesus zeroes in on the real thing. He said, if you want to be perfect, sell what you have and give to the poor. Don't think that Jesus wanted to discourage this young man. You, he said, will have treasure in heaven. Well, that should satisfy any acquisitive nature cultivated from youth. But Jesus couldn't do any evangelism, however, without telling the young man about the cross. In Matthew 19, 16 through 22, he ends this conversation by pointing him to, G to the cross. He says, come and follow me. And so this youth could have had first chance at becoming an apostle Paul had he followed, chosen to follow Jesus. But the poor fellow had a terrific problem and it was worse than leprosy or even being blind. He was a rich young man for we are told that he had great possessions. And so he turned around and he walked away. Later, Jesus conceded to his disciples about it, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Then he repeated it with a slight difference in Mark 10, 23 through 25. He said, who trust in riches. He appears to contradict what he said in Matthew 11 about his yoke being easy and his burden light here in Matthew 28 through 30. Again, legalists may delight for they don't like that easy, word easy or light idea. If you are rich and everybody who gets this message is in some way or another, you can solve your problem by confessing that you don't deserve a whit of the wealth that you possess. What is your right? is the second death, that Jesus died in your place and for you. And there is a cure that this young man could have picked up on, but there is a cure for the love of possessions and materialism. It's amazing even to think about it. And you can walk on air through God's universe because genuine agape, God's love, is poured into your once empty heart by the Holy Spirit. And that's the uh, ultimate of citizenship in God's great universe, having the Holy Spirit pour God's love into you. Given us, not merely offered to us, is God's love. And of course, you can refuse God's love. The dear Lord isn't going to force it upon you. He gives it, but your job is to receive it. And you do that by believing that God has given this love to you, receiving God's promise of his love to you. In other words, appreciating it. Letters like 
the Apostle Paul's uh, written to the Ephesians or Romans were not just pastoral messages to Paul's churches, but they were real true evangelism. And the Jews who were scattered abroad out of Jerusalem and, and it, Palestine had spread abroad the idea of one true God, so that in many areas of the then known world there were Gentiles who were interested in the true God. And so now comes along the Apostle Paul with this big idea that really turns the world upside down, as mentioned in Acts 17 verse 6. So what lies before us soon is the final replay of that glorious history in the loud cry yet to lighten the earth with glory that John the Revelator wrote about in Revelation 18 verses 1 through 4. So Paul's big idea is this. He expresses it in Romans chapter 5 that the Son of God has become the second or last Adam who incorporated the human race in himself, and he has undone and reversed what the first Adam did by his fall. So we read this in Romans 5, through one man, referring to Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. If by the one man's offense the many, which is everybody, died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the same, the many. He goes on, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation for the human race. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification, that is, for the same many. But both are objective or legal, thus they are in Christ. Otherwise, none of us could draw a breath, and justification by faith awaits our believing, and thus receiving this free gift. So Paul's big idea was a real breakthrough. Major translations of Romans state that what Christ accomplished was a gift, or a free gift, whereas one... One popular rendition insists that it was only an offer that Christ accomplished. The difference is huge. If it's mere offer, if a mere offer is refused, as the vast majority of Earth's inhabitants have done about it, refusing it, then the one making the offer really suffers no loss in his assets. For example, if I offer you a check for $1,000 and you refuse to cash it or deposit it to your account, then my account suffers no loss. I have not actually given you anything. And this idea really dismantles John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he merely offered, made an offer. No, we are told that Jesus gave himself to hell for us forever. He tasted death, the real thing, for every man. What Christ accomplished, says Paul, redeems the world. He purchased it. We read in 1 Corinthians 6.20, You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Our sin in Adam brings its wages. It earns something, and that is death, which is the real thing, the second death. But Christ took all those wages that we owed. He took them in himself, and he died it. The second that would have come to the human race had he not been the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. And so Jesus not only saved the human race, as stated in John 4.42, he also tasted death for every individual person, you and me. Hebrews 2 verse 9. All men have been bought with this infinite price, writes Sister White, by pouring the whole treasury of heaven into this world, by giving us in Christ all heaven, God has purchased 
the will, that's your choice, the affections, the mind, the soul of every human being. Whether believers or unbelievers, she writes, all men are the Lord's property. That's in Christ's Object Lessons, page 326. On his cross, Jesus had planned not to be resurrected, but heaven couldn't let the grave hold him forever. Acts 2, verse 24. And so when Jesus drew his last breath, he cried out, It is finished. There was nothing more that an infinite God could do. Love was finally exposed to the universe. So now you can prepare to be happy when you meet Jesus face to face. Luke 16 relates the parable about an unjust steward who had been defrauding his boss and embezzling his funds. And the boss heard about it and fired him. So the man was clever enough to go to all of the people who owed money to his boss and reduce and negotiate their bills down lower, thus making a lot of friends at the expense of the boss. And when the boss finally threw him out, all he had to do was knock on the doors of those people who had, whom he had reduced their debt, and they took him in. Now, some don't think that this parable belongs in the Bible, but Jesus commended that unjust steward, and he said, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So make sure somebody will welcome you into heaven, someone you have won to Christ. When you meet Jesus face to face, you'll have no merit of your own to plead. But thank God that you are alive today, that you can repent, that you can overcome, and that the Lord can restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Joel 2.25 You can give him your heart. And from this moment on, you can cooperate with that great high priest and gather in sheaves for his everlasting kingdom. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, thank you today for the good news that we've read about, that Jesus is our Adam, who has taken our wages of the second death, and he has not merely offered, but given to us the free gift of his love and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.